Pardon the interruption, but I'm Mike Wilbon. I know you didn't stay up to watch all the football and basketball last night, Tone. Did you at least sleep well? Tony Kornheiser, yeah. I had a weird dream that I hosted this show from home the last four years. Okay, Bobby Ewing. Were you in a shower when you woke up and realized this? So Dallas did the dream sequence. Yes. And Bob Newhart did the dream sequence. Yes, the old, the, On the, the new, second new Bob show. Newhart show the and the second show. Suzanne Plachette. Yes. Wakes up, Emily. Yeah. We've lost yes. all the audience by referring that far back. Just Hi, Pookie. I'm gonna get one. Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. In today's episode, the Pacers and Pelicans advance. The Heisman finalists are set, and I'm back, baby. <laughs> Don't get used to it. Don't get used to it. Promise and we promise. begin today with the Monday night game, where Cincinnati upset Jacksonville in Jacksonville in overtime, 34-31. The quarterbacks were the big story. Both Jake Browning and Trevor Lawrence completed a huge percentage of their passes. Browning was at 87%. Lawrence was at 76 Wilbon, do you want to start with Browning's surprise success or the fact that Lawrence sprained his ankle and had to leave the game? To me, you got to start with Trevor Lawrence because they were looking good. It was a tight game, but with Trevor Lawrence in there, I suspect that Jacksonville would have won that game in Jacksonville with Trevor Lawrence playing well. And then Jacksonville would have been the number one overall seed in the AFC today. They would have, I guess, won whatever tiebreaker with Kansas City and been the number one seed. But, but I hope he gets back in two or three weeks at least high ankle number. sprain. Well, with Baltimore. Okay, with Baltimore. But Tony Browning, and by the way, you think I lost some audience already. Browning in Cincinnati means something else to us. Remember Tom Browning? Yeah. Pitcher on the Reds teams that won the World Series one year. He threw a perfect game, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, this Browning, how do you come in and play that well? Okay. How do you, you, you just, you walk in off the street, no one knows who you are outside of the what is it, the Queen City, Queen City, and you play that well? So let me just say this, because I'm one of those people you're talking about. Man. I had no idea who he was. No. I did not even know Browning's name. I, I mean, I just assumed, Mike, that when Joe Burrow went out, Cincinnati went out. So this kid comes in, he throws for, what do we got here, 354 yards. That's great. Um, this is what you were talking about yesterday in a different context, in the context of Florida State. But you made the point that sports provides us the opportunity for people, unknown people, to come in off the bench and win a game or two. Now, you mentioned Lou Gehrig and well, Tom Brady. I'm not, I'm not going to go to that <laughs> with Browning, extreme. but he had a great game. But you are, you are absolutely right that the essential story of that game is Trevor Lawrence going out. Because all the pregame chatter is about what you said, how they could be the number one seed in the AFC. That storyline goes away when he's, stand, you know, he's trying to get up on his feet and he can't play. I don't know how long he's going to be out, High ankle but sprints. right now, it's Mike, tough. if he can't play this weekend, if you took the seven playoff teams right now from the AFC who would yeah. qualify, four of them will be without starting quarterbacks. Indianapolis is without one. Jacksonville, Pittsburgh, and Cleveland are without them. Quarterbacks, they've gone, and some of them have gone down this year, not last night, without contact, like yeah, Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers. No contact. But, but Tony, yes. But yet you've got to invest something, if not as much money as you'd like, because Burrow makes all the money. That's right. You've got to invest something, scouting prowess, in getting a backup quarterback because the odds your starting quarterback That's right. will be hurt are higher so than Mike, you want them to so be. So you get Josh Dobbs, who gives you two to three weeks of magic, yeah. but the magic goes away. It There's does. a difference. If you've got the overall number one pick like Burrow and Lawrence, you can't it lose. It doesn't last forever. It doesn't. Let's move to the NBA's in-season tournament. Tyrese Halliburton, you've been hearing about him, Your boy. had his first career triple-double to lead the Pacers over the Celtics last night, while Brandon Ingram had 30, and the Pelicans eliminated the Kings in Sacramento. Don't like that bean. Both teams now advance to Thursday's semis in Las Vegas. Tony, do you see last night's wins by the Pacers and Pels? As big achievements, little achievements, or nothing at all? My first inclination is to say nothing at all other than a win in an 82-game season. Because I, I don't really understand what this necessarily gets you. It doesn't get you into the playoffs. I mean, it doesn't... There's no, to me, no particular tangible reward for this thing. I, I mean, I honestly I think that they ought to have something to do with the playoffs. But I will also say that because I don't really understand how it works, I could be 100% wrong. The players seemed to think it was a big deal. I saw the Indiana fans. They thought it was a big deal. They didn't think it was one out of 82. Now, maybe that's because they haven't had playoff success recently, or maybe it's because they beat Boston, which is the best 
team in the East. So I could be wrong on this. It may be at least a little something and maybe more. It means a lot to the two teams specifically. Not to me. I understand the in-season tournament. I just brush it offside right. as being nonsense, but I'm old, and it's not for me. It's not targeted at you That's or right. me, That's the right. in-season tournament. But, Tony, the Indiana Pacers are a really young team, and they've got Tyrese Halliburton, who from day one, I've been telling you, this yeah. kid is great. Tony, he's first team all NBA you say right this now. this all the time. I, what did he do last night? Oh, I'm, oh, he beat okay. the Celtics. You say, you say him he beat the best Shea team. Shea Gilgis Alexander. Shea Gilgis Alexander. But but I, but I, look, also, Tony, the, 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 the Pelicans, Zion only had, I think, 10 points last night, played 28 minutes. He was not great. But Brandon Ingram was, and C.J. McCollum was, and Herb Jones was. With 23 points, he's a non-offensive player. Tony, these two teams have a lot to show themselves before the playoffs. Okay. It means but my, the world to those two teams. It means I, nothing to I Boston. Get that. I get that. that but I think you should tie something in here with the playoffs. I mean, because if you tied it to the playoffs in some way – then you might get Minnesota and Philadelphia, I Denver. So you want the tiebreaker well, to involve at least yeah, look, the teams at the top. It, it's based on soccer, European I, soccer. I, I, I like but they don't have playoffs in European That's, soccer. No, they don't. So it's a no. great reward in and of itself. Playoffs yeah, count but, for but, everything but these here. two teams took a lot. Yeah, that's right. Their team's trying to prove it. Right. Big deal. You got to prove it in December. You got to prove it in yeah. May. April, May. Yeah, the four Heisman finalists were announced yesterday. They are Jaden Daniels, quarterback of LSU. Bo Nix, quarterback of Oregon, Michael Penix Jr., quarterback of Washington, and Marvin Harrison Jr., wide receiver of Ohio State. Wilbon, to whom would you give your vote? Marvin Harrison. Um, I voted for 25 years. I voted. I don't vote anymore. I would vote for Marvin Harrison Jr., period. I, I wouldn't even hesitate. I wouldn't have to look at the rest of the other, the finalists. By the way, those kids have had great seasons. Yeah. Jaden Daniels, we don't, we're just unwrapping the present that is Jaden Daniels. We don't know what he's going to be. You know, he's 6'4", 210 pounds, and can run like that, 1,100 yards rushing. And obviously, you know, when you get to be a Heisman Trophy finalist, you've had the great year. Michael Penix Jr., been around six years in college football, has had a All the quarterbacks season. are transfers, I believe. I, that's right. I, I think all three are that. transfers. But I'm giving mine to Marvin Harrison Jr. Yeah. What about you? So I'm very surprised that you didn't, Give it to Caleb Williams because you've been sitting here. Last year. You've been slurping this kid for three years year. at this point. Last year. And I'm sort of surprised he's not a finalist as the incumbent. Like he, he had season again. touchdowns and five he interceptions. Did. Pretty he had good. A great season. But he was he was robbed by his team because USC he's, was seven and five and they were undone by a terrible defense. I agree with you that Marvin Harrison is a junior is the best player, but statistics matter a little bit. He's ninth in the country in receiving yards and only 36 in catches. So he'll be a high draft choice. He's not winning this. Bo Nix has this incredible statistic where he's got 40 touchdown passes and only three interceptions, right? And he completes 77% of his passes. But he lost the two most important games to Michael Penix Jr., yes, who doesn't nice. have his stats because he completes 66% of his passes and he went 33-9 and nine with touchdowns and interceptions. So for me, it's, it's Daniels. He's the safe and reasonable choice because not only did he have 40 touchdown passes and only four, four interceptions, so that's Nick's territory, but as you say, 1,134 rushing and 10 rushing touchdowns. Yeah. So I, I don't know that you can go anywhere but him. I don't know that you can. Marvin Harrison Jr., In the, the reason he doesn't have the numbers is because Ohio State was beating people 50 to 6, and he didn't keep throwing the ball. And they got other receivers, too, who are going to be in the league. Yeah. Marvin Harrison Jr., if he was on an average team, he'd have 200 catches in a college season. He's that great. He's that great. 200? Well, 100. Really? 100. Let's take a break. 15. Coming up, how much confidence do players have in trick plays? We're going to ask Jeff Saturday. I'm lobbying for him to be in that midnight blue. We'll also ask him about a below-the-radar issue that he thinks contributed to the Niners beating the Eagles. He wouldn't have 200 catches. No, 100. And by the way, his quarterback just went into the portal. Everybody's in the portal. Are except in the portal? Northwestern and Michigan. Do you know that stat? Only two Power 5 schools didn't have a kid go to the portal this week. Northwestern and Michigan. Really? How about Pardon the Interruption is presented by Grey Goose. Be watching Pardon the Interruption. Presented by Grey Goose. Part of Happy Hour. Let's get back into the NFL with our great friend ESPN NFL analyst Jeff Saturday. I gotta go to the glasses here to read these. Trevor Lawrence suffered a high ankle sprain when left tackle Walter Little stepped backwards onto his ankle as a lineman 
How significant is that concern? Are there ways to avoid that movement? Well, before I get into that, I just want to say welcome back to a studio, baby. That, I mean, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> took four years. In it. I mean, I know a lot's changed for you, you know, but we're back. Man. We're back in action. Wow, thanks. So there you are, my friend. <laughs> so going to the, the, the position of an offensive lineman, there is really very little you can do. Kind of the rule of thumb is the quarterback has to avoid you. He feels the pressure. You do all you can to stop a bull rush, kind of anchor down, walk yourself back or hop yourself back. But very little you can do. And I will tell you, it is a thing of nightmares. What happened to Trevor Lawrence from an offensive line perspective, whether you step on his toe and hurt him, whether you roll his ankle up, fall on him, whatever. It is It is the thing of nightmares. Because an offensive lineman, the last thing you want to do is draw attention to yourself. Damn. And you getting pushed back into somebody draws attention to you and hurts the most important player in the franchise. That never feels good. Well, Jeff, the Bengals had some... Weird stuff going on last night. They had that trick play go awry when Tyler Boyd threw that ugly pick. When you were in the huddle all those years, and that sort of trick play is called, I mean, are there just some times that you're thinking, oh, my God, I'd rather not have this? It is feast or famine. And mostly it's famine when it happens to those guys. <laughs> this is what I used to say. We ain't paying receivers to throw it better than Peyton Manning. All right, let's just be real. So, yeah, okay, we better catch him with, with no knowledge of what's happening for this thing. And if it doesn't look perfect, throw that thing away. Eat it, grab it, carry it, whatever you got to do. And listen, the, the, the best part about it, when we would practice these things, whether it was like Joseph Adai or Marv or Reggie, like they can't throw. They're like taking gloves off to try to throw the pass and then they make bad decisions. You saw it last night. There's no way you should throw that ball. Just eat it. Take the loss and move on. So to your point, Michael, listen, it's feast or famine. If it's even a breath of famine, just take it to the next play. Do not compound the, 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 a bad play and make it the worst play, and that's what happened last night. Don't throw that wounded duck. All right, we're going to move to the Niners for a second. <laughs> the Niners running away from the Eagles on Sunday. You were the brush, fre uh, voice of common sense this morning. When you said the Eagles might have been fatigued, they might have been tired in that second yeah. half. You saw this coming because of the schedule, Jeff. So what does weariness from schedule play in a team performance? How can you see that coming or can you? Yeah, you can see it. Listen, I mean, here's the reality of it. They beat some really good teams, whether it's the Chiefs, the Bills, the Dolphins. Like, they beat some very good teams over the past four or five weeks. They faced the 49ers, who's off 10 days. They played on things. So they, they're fresh as a daisy. They're coming into your place. And you saw it. It's 13-6 at halftime. And, again, I'm not making an excuse. The Eagles didn't play well. But where you saw it really translate was the physicality. All of a sudden, San Francisco looked like they're, they're in a whole nother world, right? You got Debo catching the ball five yards, running right through the middle of the defense to go score, catches a screen, and takes it all the way in. They're pushing the offensive lineman back, getting pushed back on defense. And it's just one of those things where three games and, and 13 days, this, it's not an excuse. It's just part of it. There are reasons why teams look bad at times. So take that and know. Listen, I, you don't ever want to lose. You don't want to lose bad. But it happens. And it happens in the NFL. And when you play a, a schedule like the Eagles have played, sometimes it shows that way. Now, we'll get you out of here on this. Deion Sanders is among the coaches combing the portal for offensive linemen. You went undrafted. You got cut by the Ravens. It's fascinating to find this out. You were working in an electrical supply store before the Colts took a yes. chance on you. What do you think when you look at the opportunities and the compensation that the portal offers linemen like you? You probably didn't get a dime in college. I, I didn't get a dime in college. I didn't get much when I first started in the NFL either. It took me a little while to prove it. But I, I will say this. The situation you go to matters. So, so what I would tell you is a guy like me who is an undersized, more of an athletic offensive lineman, you want to go find that system. You, you don't want to go find a system where they're asking you to go play in a phone booth. You know, I tell people all the time, if you looked at my career and Nick Mangold's career, he went to a bunch of Pro Bowls, had an incredible career. I did the same. But we ain't the same player. He could play that power, that power team. He's going to, you know, drive block. He wants to play in a phone booth. I want to get out in space, go chase line backers, reach players. So you want to find the system or the situation that best suits your ability. Don't worry 
worry about the money now because I can assure you, offensive linemen ain't making it in college like they will in the league. Get yourself to the right situation in the pros by doing the right thing by yourself in college. Thank you so much, oh. Jeff. Thank you. Youngsters, listen to Jeff Saturday. You know it. Let's take one last break still to come. Finally, some news about Shohei Otani's free agency possibilities. And NCAA President Charlie Baker will reportedly propose a structure that could further fuel payments to players. The players should just put their hands out. They're, they're pros now in college. They're pros. Just by put the way, your hand you out and get started? money. Northwestern players about 15 years ago talk. Pardon the interruption is presented by Grey Goose. Vive la vodka. Please sip responsibly. Part of happy hour. Happy time, people. Happy 32nd birthday, Christian Yelich. The Milwaukee Brewers outfielder has been stuck in neutral for a while now. After establishing himself as a good player over five seasons in Miami, Yelich was dealt to Milwaukee in 2017 when the Marlins were cleaning house and getting rid of Giancarlo Stanton and Dee Gordon and Marcelo Zuna as well. Yelich's first two years in Milwaukee were terrific. He was the National League MVP in 2018 after batting 326 with 36 home runs and 110 RBI. The next year, Yelich was just as good, batting 329 with 44 homers, 97 RBI. But in the three full seasons since then, and the shortened COVID season of 2020, Yelich has batted 254, yeah. and he's hit just 54 wow. home runs, but, you know, happy birthday. Maybe he needs to be reunited with his old manager, Craig Council. Maybe. I'm just saying. Do you hate him because he's on the Brewers? Yeah. Right. But I could like him. But if he was on the Cubs? I learned to like Dennis Rodman. Yes. Yeah, so you know you, what I'm saying? Okay. I mean, that's how that works, right? All right. Okay. It's... Happy anniversary, Tim Brown. On this day 36 years ago, the Notre Dame senior wide receiver became the last Notre Dame player to win the Heisman Trophy. Brown went on to a Hall of Fame NFL career, mostly with the Raiders. Because of this long drought, Notre Dame is now tied with USC, Ohio State, and Oklahoma for the most Heisman wins, seven. Since Brown's Heisman, there have been just two wide receivers to win the award. Desmond Howard of Michigan in 1991 and oh, Devontae Smith of Alabama in 2020. Ooh. Ohio State's Marvin Harrison Jr. could add his name to that list this year, but to me, that seems like a real long shot. Maybe it's a long shot. We talked about this early in the show. I'd like Marvin Harrison to win it. Tim Brown was such a great player. I mean, it, it, at all levels, at Notre Dame, at the Raiders, it's just, you know, I sat with him at an NBA All-Star game recently. It was it's amazing the prejudice towards quarterbacks and running backs Man, on the high school. It's too much. It's, it's, it's gone too far. It's, you can't consider a defensive player. No more Rod Woodson's out there. Charles Woodson, Charles excuse Woodson. me, Charles. Charles. Happy trails to the quiet surrounding Shohei Otani's free agency. Our old friend Kenny Rosenthal writes that the Toronto Blue Jays are believed to have met with Otani yesterday at the Blue Jays' spring training complex in Florida. Rosenthal writes that the Cubs and Dodgers remain in pursuit of Otani, and Dodgers manager Dave Roberts said today that Otani met with his team a couple of days ago. Otani and his agent have deliberately tried to keep all meetings and communications private, if not secret. Toronto's been a playoff team with Vlad Guerrero Jr. and Bo Bichette, but I would not have put them in the Otani sweepstakes. Mike, would you? I love Toronto. I love it. It's one of my favorite cities in the world. But a more favorite city of mine, where Otani could be the biggest star, much bigger than in L.A., where there's a lot of land and a lot of stuff to compete with. If you're a star in Chicago, do I need to go back over some of the stars in Chicago? The biggest star in NBA history lived in Chicago and played there. If Otani goes to Chicago, How did Mitch Trubisky his do impact, when he, was a well, he star. wasn't a star. Oh, I thought he was. A if star. Otani goes to Chicago and plays in the Club Blue, right. he will be 10 times the star he would be in Los Angeles. Ten times. The, the scope of that statement is so insane not that insane. I'm not even going it's to answer insane. it. It's not. Um, because Los Angeles is a city of stars. Stars. Okay. Plural. No. Okay. Huh? I wouldn't have thought Toronto, and I wouldn't have thought Toronto. the Cubs. I would have thought the Dodgers all along. Toronto's so great. You know. I, Such a great city. Is it Such a baseball? A is it a baseball city? It's an international uh, city, is, and Otani represents all of that. I understand that, but is it a baseball city, and is it a city? They've like, won. They have good teams. So there. you think they're ready to win? He wants to go win because the Dodgers are ready to win. It ain't like the place he's been ready is ready to win, been, been playing. All right.
Angels, they're not ready. We're running out of show. We go to the big fish. Let's do it. Caleb Williams will not play for USC in the Holiday Bowl. I take it it's all right with you. Yes, Caleb Williams, it's time to go to the top of the draft board. Enough with a minor bowl game. The NCAA will propose that certain schools be able to pay their own players through NIL and trust funds. That's a big deal, isn't it? No, stop for a second. Come on. The NCAA was against this for 100 years. Yes, it was. And now they're trying to climb on board Thank on the top of the bus. Thank you. These guys are professional athletes now. Not student athletes. Don't need the NCAA. Stop. Amen. Pro Football Talk reports that the NFL's competition committee is reviewing the tush push play again. Your thoughts? Yeah, everybody knows Goodell hates it, so they'll review it and they'll probably get rid of it. The Athletic reports that Inter, Inter Miami, almost at Inter Milan, Inter Miami is close to signing Luis Suarez to a one year deal. Is that significant? Well, they already have Messi. He was Messi's teammate for a while. They seem to be ahead of the other MLS teams. They seem to know how to market. I know you hate marketing. They seem yeah, to know. Yeah, last one, your Coyotes yeah. have beaten the last five Stanley Cup champs over the last five games. You impressed? They beat the Caps 6 nothing last night. It's hard to be impressed when you're playing in a place with four or 5,000 seats. But they're better. They're middle of the pack. I'm not going to hate on the Coyotes. I'm not going to do it. We're out of time. We'll try and do better the next time. I don't know if I'm going to be here the next time, but maybe sometime. I'm Tony Kornheiser. I'm Mike Wilbon. Same time tomorrow, Knuckleheads. I'll be here. Well, I'll be in Vegas. You're not going to be here. Story. That's why you I'm not going to be here. get the PTI podcast on the ESPN app or Apple Podcasts. And now, we're not there either in Bristol. I need to have Here's your schedule team. for the next few you months. You can have it. Let's go. Write it down. Vegas, Write L.A., it. Scottsdale. Down. Let's go. Stop. PTI. Hi, Wilbon. Will the NBA's in-season tournament experience help unproven teams like the Pacers and the Pelicans? Unproven teams, Tony, I think so. And depending on what happens with the Knicks and Bucks tonight, I mean, the Bucks, no. The Knicks, maybe so. I mean, teams that haven't won. You look at Tyrese Halliburton and the Pacers, and you know, I, I love the way they play yeah. for Rick Carlisle. They don't play any defense, but nobody plays offense as spectacularly so far as they do. And the same thing with a New Orleans team that's never healthy, but when healthy, together, you go, my God, like, they're as good as anybody when out there. Those teams need to prove something to themselves first. And yeah. so I think it could help unproven teams. What do you think? So, well, you know, I'm old, and I don't really understand this tournament. I don't grasp it the way about that. younger people grasp it. Yeah. And so I'm inclined to be dismissive of it. But if you watch the crowd shots last night in the Indiana game, if you watch the shots of the players after the game, they seem to really get excited by having they did. won this. And the fans yeah. really excited. So the fans didn't look at it the way I did. That it's a win in December. What does it mean? It's, you know, it's 60 more games to go. They seem to think it was important. So if we separate this out into teams that have not proven anything, and this is the thing that they can prove, that they can win an in-season tournament that hadn't been contested ever before except in European soccer leagues, yeah. if they can win that, then I can see benefit for it there. And if that happens down the road, then I can see teams like... Philadelphia and Denver, you know, that didn't seem to care about it this year, caring about it down the road. Yeah, I, Denver shouldn't care about anything until we get to, like, May 1st. But I, I'm starting to sort of swing over to your side on the crowd and the players yeah. seem sold. This must be a generational thing. I think the court has something to do with it. I think the look of the court. You, know, you didn't see the one in Chicago. Well, it's no, so but. so red, you can't even dis determine the ball from the court. My only, my only overall feeling about this is that, differently from soccer, yeah. there are playoffs in the NBA. The playoffs count for everything. So I think they should somehow tie winning this tournament to some sort of playoff guarantee. Tiebreakers, maybe. Stop with the point differential. Again, theft from soccer. Huh? If it's so great, don't steal it from soccer. That's it. We're done. I don't understand that. We're it's old. so great. Steal it. Back to you. You should steal it. Don't it's steal so it. Great. Steal Leave it. Leave it alone. Leave it in Europe.